It's October 2020, and COVID-19 is still a thing. Pfizer and Moderna are still working to finalize their vaccines, but just because they aren't ready yet doesn't mean that students can't come back to school. I'm two months into the first year of my PhD program, and I am drowning. I'm drowning in the material of my first graduate-level math class, and it's rough. I don't have the same math backgrounds as most students in the class, and I can safely say that I've never been more stressed about math before. Not understanding the material is one thing, but I also have to worry about passing a qualifying exam in spring. If I don't pass this qual within two attempts, I'll be kicked out of school. I wanted to do something a little different. This video contains not just statistics content, but also hard-earned lessons. These are lessons from my current self to my past self, but they're also for students who might be facing similar struggles. You'll learn about why I hate the median and how this hatred pushed me to overcome the hardest test of my life. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. Let's get started. Instead of going through an entire year's worth of course material, I'm going to focus on a single homework problem I had back then. As you might expect, this problem was about the median. There's no generally agreed notation for the median, so I'm just going to denote it with a capital M. This problem was about estimating the median. Given some IID dataset that comes from some unknown population, I needed to derive the sampling distribution for a special estimator of the median. If you know the sampling distribution, you can construct hypothesis tests, p-values, and confidence intervals for it. To some of you, the median might not be so different from the mean. So what could possibly make it that hard for a graduate student? First, you have to understand what the median is. The elementary definition is that the median is the middle of a set of numbers. To get this middle, we follow an algorithm. Sort these numbers in increasing order, then pick the middle one, or the average of the middle two if the number of elements is even. This algorithm works if you just have a simple set of numbers. But things get harder when your set of numbers is a data set. A data set is just a sample. Different samples will produce different medians. In the statistical context, you can think of the median as a special location in the population distribution. More specifically, it's the smallest value such that when you evaluate it for the population CDF, the resulting cumulative probability will be equal to 50%. This definition tells us about the population median, but not about a median estimator that we need to derive from data. We can do that by defining the estimator of the median in terms of optimizing this particular function, minimizing the sum of absolute deviations. The rough intuition is that the value that roughly produces the same number of positive and negative differences will make it so that the sum is as small as it can get. There's a special name for estimators that are defined in this way, M estimators, aka estimators that maximize some function. They're close cousins to another type of estimator called a Z estimator, where Z stands for zero. That is, the estimator is a solution to a particular function. Most statistics students would be familiar with the famous maximum likelihood estimator, which is both an M and a Z estimator. The idea here is that you're defining the estimator as having a particular quality, as opposed to it having a closed form solution based on the data. You can think of M estimators as a more general case of the maximum likelihood estimators. Instead of maximizing the likelihood or log likelihood, which has some nice properties, we can also get estimators by maximizing or finding solutions to more general functions that we might not be able to necessarily differentiate. Now that you know what the problem 2020 me was dealing with, I can tell you how I began to overcome it. Pick your battles. The first tip is more of a psychological tip than a math tip. The first thing I want to point out is that grad school is a different beast than university. To get into grad school, you probably worked really hard to get a good GPA so that you could have a strong application. That was me during my master's degree. But now that I was a PhD student, I needed a mindset shift. Grades were the least of my worries now. Anything besides preparing for the qual was irrelevant because failing that test meant my PhD journey was dead in the water. I knew that as long as I maintained a B average in my classes, the minimum dictated by my department, then I was fine for grades. Pick your battles and focus on your qualifying exams rather than worry about the week-to-week -week grades. Good grades will automatically come with good understanding, but not necessarily the other way around. Know your arsenal. If you're a math major or have a strong math background, then the tips I'm about to give here might sound super basic to you. But in my field of biostatistics, it's not uncommon for someone like me to come in with a non-stat or non-math background. 
These tips are realizations that I wish I had sooner in my PhD, and they would have saved me a lot of time and stress. One of the first epiphanies I had was that, despite feeling like it was an overwhelming amount of material, a single math class in one quarter semester could only teach a finite number of things. I recommend that you make a list out of all the theorems, proofs, and examples you learn as you progress through class. This list represents your arsenal of tools. In my case, I dedicated a special notebook for all my theorems. I originally made this notebook as a quick reference that I could go back to instead of having to troll through lecture notes or the textbook. If I ran into a problem on a topic I forgot about, all I needed to do was find the specific page in my notebook with all the relevant theorems. I can't speak for other departments, but for my exam, we were actually restricted on what we could use for the exam. We were only allowed to use theorems from textbooks that we used for class. For me, it was Asymptotic Statistics by Van der Vaart and another book I can't bear to bring up. Leave me alone! Ah! Akira! Ah! On one hand, it can seem like having less theorems makes it harder to solve a problem on the exam, but I actually think this restriction helps more than it hurts. This is because of the paradox of choice. If there were only three theorems you were taught for deriving the distribution for an M estimator, then you know that one of them has to work. If you had access to a wider set of tools, it's much more stressful to just pick one, and you'll have less time to try each of them out if something goes wrong. Translate as much as you can into your own words. Once all the relevant theorems and proofs are listed out, it's time for the hard part, the actual process of learning. I'll use this theorem here because it's actually the relevant theorem for figuring out the median problem. One of the most frustrating parts about math for students is that all the notation and symbols can pretty much feel like a foreign language. To use these theorems, it's probably in your best interest to first learn what everything means. A lot of times you'll be told what different notation means in the lecture materials or in the textbook. Data usually represents a population parameter you want to know more about. This m function here is the thing we want to maximize. But from there, it's very likely there will be some things that you just can't figure out by yourself. If you don't understand a bit of notation, then this is a perfectly good question to come to your professor or TA. One thing that bothered me for a while was this statement here. I knew that this p notation represented an expectation and that a dot over the function represented a derivative, but altogether, I had no idea what it meant. But one day, my professor rewrote it in a way that made it make a lot more sense. It turned out to be a similar assumption you see in the central limit theorem. In CLT, you assume the variance is finite. Another way to represent this idea is that the second moment, aka the expectation of x squared, is also finite. So this statement here is just needed to make sure that the variance didn't explode. Without going into the greedy details, if you can confirm or assume that the m function and the estimator has these certain properties, then this particular expression on the left side can be approximated by the expression on the right. And sometimes the results of the theorem are just as hard to understand as the conditions. The actual useful result of this expression is this, that this expression here is asymptotically normally distributed with mean zero and variance equal to this expression. Develop problem outlines. Hopefully there will be a lot of example problems you get through lecture and homework, and the point of these examples will be to demonstrate the use of a particular theorem. But once you work through it, it's really easy to fall into the trap of just memorizing how the problem is done. The problem with this approach is that it'll likely fail you when it comes to similar but slightly different problems you might see in a qual. You have to learn to generalize from examples. And the way that I approached this was to develop problem outlines. A problem outline is a detailed solution to a problem. It contains not just the steps on how to solve a problem and how to use a theorem, but as many details as you can pack as to why certain steps were taken and why certain theorems were used. The purpose of going into so much detail is to internalize the logic of working through a problem. Without the why, the parts of a solution are just unrelated facts. The rationales are how you link these facts together. Then the outline itself becomes a tool for recall. After you make it, you practice recalling all of the steps and the associated logic. If you get stuck at a certain part of the outline, it directly identifies which step or which logic that you get stuck on, thus allowing you to better target weaknesses and make your studying more efficient. Here's a rough look at how it applied to the median problem. In this case, we have a specific m function, and it's not exactly clear if it has the properties specified in the theorem. What were these properties? There's a differentiability condition, and there's something called a Lipschitz condition on the function. 
Next, you have to make an assumption that the expected value of the m function has a second order Taylor expansion. Sure, that's an assumption. It also has to have some second derivative matrix, or in this case, just a second derivative. There's an assumption that the estimator nearly optimizes the m function, and that you know that the median estimator is consistent for the true median. You can think of all of these conditions and assumptions as part of a checklist. In writing your answer for the exam, you want to demonstrate that you can check off that each of these conditions or assumptions are met. In making your problem outline for a problem like this, you would take each of the parts and figure out what actions, theorems, and math you need to prove these different conditions. For the curious viewers, you can use this theorem to show that the centered, scaled version of the M estimator for the median has an asymptotic normal distribution with mean zero and variance equal to this expression. And look, it's really easy for me to list these tips in retrospect, but in reality, the processes I've described here can take several days, if not weeks, to really get through. When I was first trying to complete this median problem, I actually didn't get it done before the due date. I think I got a C on this homework, but the grade didn't really matter to me. I stayed on this problem way past the due date and kept working on it in the background until I was fully able to understand it. And as luck would have it, I was given a very similar problem on the qualifying exam that used all of the skills I needed for the median problem. Thankfully, in the end, I was able to pass the hardest test of my life. I'm not going to lie to you and say that graduate level math will be any easier if you follow these tips. Looking back as a fifth year now, it was really my first experience with struggling with the problem for an extended period of time. And this is a huge aspect of doing independent research. Just hang in there and keep learning a little bit every day, and you too will survive graduate level math. And thankfully, learning every day doesn't have to be a dreadful experience. If you're just starting out and learning the basics, then the sponsor of this video, Brilliant, can even make it a fun one. Brilliant is an online platform with over 70 interactive courses in various fields, including math, computer science, and programming. One of the best parts of Brilliant is its focus on active learning. Instead of making you mindlessly read through text, Brilliant lets you take a hands-on approach with your learning with interactive exercises and quizzes. This way, you build a more intuitive understanding of the material that will serve you better in the real world. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit Brilliant dot org slash very normal or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video. That's it for this one, a little bit different this time around, but if you like the video then I hope I've earned a subscription from you. I try to upload videos on statistics every two weeks and I have a newsletter where I can send videos straight to your inbox when they come out. You'll get extra content on what's going on behind the scenes of this channel and content that's coming up in the future. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.